Okay, guys, welcome to the show. Those who have been following the series in conversation with musical legends know that it is about all of the great artists that have been the musical tapestry of our life and growing up and are the best of times that we've ever had. And we've had some great guests, but tonight, again, a supreme eminence that is Shirley Jones of you guys know my favorite Philadelphia group, the Jones Girls, okay? So you know what this means to me to have this lady in my home. Welcome, <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> well, well, thank you for having me, Barry. Always wonderful to see you and speak with you. Well, hey, every day is a blessing with everything that the entire world's been going through. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so every standing. day... Yes, it's great seeing your smile too. <laughs> Thank you. You're still standing and still creating. Oh, which yes. is the inspirational thing about you guys. You know, you're you're still the creators, the originators and the creators. And the great thing is this series started with just great artists in general, but it seems to have coincided with 50 years of Philadelphia. So ah. <laughs> Philadelphia yeah. International Records. So, you know, we exactly. can't help that. But talk about them. And um, yeah, just hear the Jones Girl story. Because sadly, obviously, you are the only remaining of the original lineup. Valerie's yeah. gone. Brenda's gone. But Shirley is still flying the flag and brilliantly keeping the legacy alive, for which we are all grateful. Yeah, and I am too. I'm so grateful that people want to hear the music, the sounds and the songs from me and my sisters, uh, because the love that we put into recording was that this is, is fulfillment or the perfect culmination that uh, 40 years later, that people still want to hear those songs. And that that is it that just makes me so extraordinarily happy. And I know my sisters too, because I'm telling you, when we were creating and putting songs together, be it for ourselves or background for someone, we put our love, our talent, and every ounce of our energy into those songs. You put um, your heart and soul into it. And yes, you yes. Hear it, you can hear it with every note for the simple reason, I always said it, everything the Jones girls sing, it is like a masterclass in vocals. If you want to learn to sing, that is what you need to play and follow those vocals. <laughs> you know? Thank and you. The harmonies, the harmonies, untouchable. Thank you so much. Well, <laughs> that credit goes to my mom. That goes to our mother who trained our voices and taught us how to complement one another, each other with, our, with, with the different tones in our voices. Right. So we give her credit for that. Right. And what I've found is that the common denominator with most of the artists that I've spoken to, even though they may not have had official singing lessons or music lessons, the common denominator is the church. They all started in the church. Absolutely. That's, that's that where, that, that's where you get those. That's right. school of vocals. That's <laughs> the best right. school that's, of vocals. And see, my mother was music director uh, for the choir at our church for years. Right. So she, she not only uh, cultivated our voices, but the voices of a lot of people in, that were in the choir at right. Russell Street Baptist Church. <laughs> Baptist. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So you started in church from you were little girls. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I got this window open. I'm sorry. Yes, we did. We started singing background behind my mother. Right. Okay. So are there any other siblings <laughs> or are they just the three of you? Now, through that union, through my mother and father's union, <laughs> right. it's the three of us. Right. Okay. But my father was a minister, a Rolling Stone minister, okay. and he <laughs> and there there are three other sets from three other different wives. Okay. <laughs> so it was a total 
of my father on my father's side i think it's seven of us <clears throat> seven wow mm -hmm. and were you three the only musical ones or did it run in your family well we we don't we didn't know the other ones we don't know them that well right. but you, yes as far as i know it's yeah. just the three of us so then the music we have to say comes <clears throat> from your mother because she was oh the, yeah yeah she's she was a she was a very, very popular gospel singer back in the day, singing right. with the likes of like Della Reese and Jackie mm -hmm. Wilson. So, and in fact, she was the first black gospel singer that RCA Records ever signed back in the day. Okay. And they signed her. Yeah, they signed my mother. RCA signed her to the gospel label the same exact day that they signed Little Richard to the pop label. <laughs> wow. You see, that's why it's so important to speak with you guys and get these stories because they're important and they're our stories and they need to be told. Yes, they do. And I enjoy telling it, you know, because you know, it is a, it is a, a journey that, that I've been on uh, in this realm called music, which yeah. is the ultimate to me. Music is everything to me. Yeah. So, of course, you say it, it started from church, mm -hmm. from singing at church. And at which stage did you decide that, well, you know what, music is going to be my career? About, I was maybe about 11 or 12 when we stopped singing with my mother. I mean, well, we still sang with her, but when we got introduced to the secular music, there right. was a, a label in Detroit uh, called GM that was owned by this elderly Jewish couple right. that had heard, heard about us singing from the different people. My mother was also a nurse and one of her friends, uh, nursing friends had told her about these people that had a label and they wanted to wanted us to sing. Well, they recorded a couple of gospel songs with her, with us singing background. Uh, but then a, a guy had written a song uh, called Learn How to Love that was a secular song. Okay. Yeah, my mother, she agreed to let us do it, but hesitantly because she, of course, you know, wanted us to continue. She really wanted us to be more like the Clark sisters or the Winans. And, yeah, and, you know, continue the gospel. Exactly. Wow. Continue down the gospel path. But that record came out and it was a little local hit. And it, and of course, with us being, you know, preteens, uh, having a local hit, uh, we were like, OK, well, we kind of like we like the secular stuff. Mom. And <laughs> after <laughs> after much uh, prodding, you know, and uh, at her, us agreeing to still sing background for her on Saturdays and Sundays when we would visit various churches. She let us uh, cut a few more songs. And wow. yeah, and through those songs, we became uh, uh, Holland Dozier Holland, who had just, Motown had just given them their own label called Music Merchant. Right. They heard about us and and uh, asked us to, you know, come over there where, of course, that was even more exposure than the local uh, studio that we started in. Right. But, uh, so we, we uh, did several more that became regional hits with Music Merchant and Holland Dozier Holland. Well, I mean, that's a good place to start. Holland Dozier Holland. I mean, they are they are great songwriters and producers. Great. Absolutely. At the best, you know, Motown. I mean, all of the Supreme stuff. And so just working with those guys, because, of course, growing up in Detroit during that during in the during the 60s, the, the, the group that we idolized was the Supremes. You know, we. Oh, yes. My mom would put up, try to put outfits, make us the kind of outfits that we would see them in and. Uh, we would practice, especially once we started having those local and regional hits. We that's we groomed our, we taught ourselves. We just loved the movement of the Supremes, and 
uh, they were our idols. So of course, having the opportunity to work with uh, Holland Dozier Holland at 13, 14 years old, that was a dream come true for us. Absolutely. And then to later on be doing BVs with the person that you idolized. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yes. You've <laughs> arrived. You have yes. arrived. There's nothing yes. better. That's but for sure. You guys, were you always uh, a trio? Did you always sing together? Or I know you later on did your solo thing, but was it always the Jones Girls as a threesome? Never well, ever it's... thought before of doing anything solo. Well, it was it was pretty much always a threesome yeah. because we're stair steps. So once my mom for for a minute before Brenda decided to join us, you know, uh, it was my mom and I when I was about seven, seven, eight years old. She would, you know, bring me up on stage and let me sing a song with her. Uh, Brenda at that time was six and Valerie was probably four. So oh. as as we ate. Uh, Brenda wanted some of that action, and my mother, my mother realized, oh well, she can sing too. So then it was the three of us, and Valerie was always shy and bashful, uh, and then she came along, you know, a couple of years later. And by the time she was nine, I was by then pushing thirteen. Um, it was the three of us, the Jones sisters, and eventually the Jones girls, and it went on from there. Yeah. So who were you, were you signed to anybody apart from the, the first one you mentioned with Holland Dozer Holland before you went to Philly? Was there anything in between there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Curtis Mayfield, you know, right after Holland Dozer Holland, our contract ended with them. Curtis Mayfield had heard about us. And I mean, we started working out of Chicago with him uh, singing background for people like Linda Clifford. Yeah. Uh, we did that Runaway Love album for her. Uh, we did some cut, some things, uh, did background on a couple of Curtis Mayfield stuff, as well as the so impression. That was Curtum label, was it? Curtum? That was Curtum. Mm -hmm. yeah, Curtum. Yeah. yeah. Because the funny thing is like, you know, real music people, you, you buy the tunes you like, you don't necessarily read all the credits on the back. Right. But my ears are so attuned to the Jones girls that I could hear, even before Runaway Love, I, I can't let this good thing get away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying, this sounds like something I know, like people I know. I know the voices, and it's only when I looked on the credits, the Jones girls, you know? Yes. Yep. And that that's, those credits are on a lot of albums for a lot of other people because uh, we were the premier background singers out there in California for years, even, you know, for several, a couple of years prior to us getting with Diana Ross. Yeah. And I mean, more often than not, that, that again is the, the common denominator that seems to go through all of the artists. They all start as great backing vocalists. And yes. People are going, listen, you sing better than me. You should be doing this for you. <laughs> You're making me sound good. But you should be doing this for you. You know, and so that, many of them started like that. They did. And, and that, that's exactly what happened to us with uh, Dinah Ross. In fact, when we got the opportunity with her, our first, our first trip with her, our first performance ever, was at London, there at London. Right. And we, uh, after that Europe tour, well, we're from London, we went of course to Germany, Paris. I mean, we were in Europe, but the very first performance with her was there in London at Victoria Hall, I believe it was, we were there. Right. Okay. And that, when we finished that tour, which was I think a two to three month tour, cause we were all over Europe with her. Once we came back to the States, uh, she approached us right before we were getting ready to do um, Caesar's Palace in Vegas for a two week, three week run. And she told us that she had gotten such rave reviews uh, from Europe about us wow. that she was offering us the opportunity to during one of her costume changes, which we all know there were many for <laughs> Diana back, um, for us to pick a song and learn a song because she really wanted 
to introduce us to the world because she said to us, you guys are too good to sing background behind me or anybody forever. And that's what we did. We picked the song, uh, If I Ever Lose This Heaven by Quincy Jones. And uh, she, she, uh, she was definitely a woman of her word. She would bring us, she would introduce us and she would go change clothes and we would perform our song. Wow. Yes. I mean, what an introduction that is. That is a real introduction from yes, it is. somebody yes. who is, has got weight. You know what I mean? Diana Ross exactly. says, listen to my girls while I get exactly. changed. You know, that's a great introduction. Yes. And, you know, I love it that you are living proof that you, you stand behind your Diana. You, you back up your Diana because you say, if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be the Jones girls as you know us. Right, right. Because, you know, once we performed our song in Philadelphia, Gamble and Huff were in the yeah. audience. And that's the, the rest is, you know, our history with Philly International. Yeah. Which I mean, is where yeah. we produce some of the and, uh, you know, some of the best music of the 80s, late 70s and 80s ever. I'm, and I, I am so proud. Put my to, hand up in a group. Yes. Oh, yeah, because I'm so proud to be a part of Philly International and because of the writers and the producers and the musicians. Um, they, that, that company wrote love songs, wrote socially active songs, you know, and they, it, it was just the best music and and the proof of it is that it's played now 50 years later we're we're celebrating 50 years of philly international and it's all because of the beauty of the music the message that was in the music and i mean as you say obviously you know motown was the inspiration for most people because oh, yes. of the time it came out and you right. were seeing black people in great roles, you know, made you think, yeah, I can be a prince. I can be a princess. I can be a king. I can be anything, you know? But right. Philly was the, the extension of that as Motown was going slightly and, you know, Philly was coming. But I mean, when you stop and think of the number of people that were under the umbrella of Philadelphia International. Give yes. me goose pimples. I mean, yes. Lou Rawls, Teddy Prendergast, you know, it just was endless. Patti LaBelle, oh, you guys. The OJ, Gene Karn, Phyllis endless. Hyman, Dexter Wanzell. Yes. Uh, every. Yeah. It was so much beautiful, beautiful music. And of course, a lot of the writings and the, and the messages came from the duo Gamble, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. Yeah. So, I mean, the classics, so, you know, Love Train, you know, yeah. Family Reunion, Nights, uh, Nights Over Egypt, You're Gonna Make Me Love Somebody Else. You know, all of those songs um, came from either Gamble and Huff or writers associated with, with Philly yeah. International. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as you say, the quality was so good. Where is she gone? Hold on. <laughs> there we go. There we I go. was getting a phone call. Um, the quality of the music was so good. The standard was so high. And the mark of that is how many times it has been covered by subsequent artists that want yes. to sing those songs. Yeah, or, or, or and or rappers using sampling. Yes, sampling it. Yes, you know all of that is what goes to account that you know it was the music of the highest standard. Couldn't get any better. Right. Yep. That's for sure. That is for sure. So, what was your first hit with Philadelphia International? You're gonna make me love somebody else. <laughs> yeah. <that>, yeah. <laughs> that's the one. But that's a great album. Again, you know, it was an era of albums that you could just, when you had a needle, a stylus, put it on and leave it. You didn't have to skip a track and say, oh, no, I don't really like that one. Or that. You just put it on at the beginning, let it play till the end, you know? And, and th- exactly. And that's what we did. That's what we, um, we planned, 
you know, we in discussion, the order, you know, the order that the album would be uh, a, the A side and then the B side. We, we had lots of just, and Gamble and Huff allowed us to have input in, into that. So yeah. that was, you know, and that helped us later on, even once we weren't with Gamble and Huff and then me, my solo project, especially. Um, and even now when I'm recording, I, it's a certain sequencing of the album, which is very important because I've always wanted people to be able to start it and just let it run. Let it play Not to have end. to... Yeah, not pick up and say, well, I really don't like that one that much, but I'm a, you know, so yeah. that that that's the beauty of And I mean a lot of artists that, that I've interviewed, they've said, Well, yeah, you know, all of the tracks are our babies because we wrote them, we sang them. And yeah, you know, some of the tracks I do have to work a little harder to love than others. But mm -hmm. you know, as you say, the sequence makes all the difference because if it flows in a sequence. You know, some of the tracks that might not be as great as the number one single, if it's in the right sequence, it slips in perfectly. It and, does. And you appreciate it just as much, you know? Exactly. You do. So then you went solo as Shirley Jones, because that yeah. was Philly, right? Yes, it Getting was. Mm -hmm. love. Yeah. Yeah. Getting and it was love. it was it was actually after we had left, uh, we had left Philadelphia and went to RCA Records and did the album over there the on target album uh with rca and then after that we took a break uh they you okay. know brenda got brenda got married and you know wanted to um move to atlanta because we were all living in los angeles at the time and valerie wanted to experience college so she kind of went, went back to detroit and stayed okay. with my mom and I just was just floating around you know singing still doing background with other people uh, on uh, a lot of uh, background work for George Duke uh, some oh. of his projects like uh, Shantae Moore's first album I did um, with Ho uh, Howard Hewitt and Lynn Davis and I and then Phyllis Hyman and I and did and Vesta, we would do background for different people on occasion. Um, when I got a phone call one evening from Gamble asking me, what was I doing and what were my plans? And I told him, I said, well, right now my plans are, you know, I don't know. I just really want to sing. And he said, I said, and I, you know, I told him, I said, I'm doing background and keeping up, you know, trying to yeah. just maintain. And he said, well, have you ever thought about a solo project? And I said, no. And he said, well, would you be interested in doing it? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I remember I was standing in my kitchen and I'm like, absolutely. What and, took uh, you so long to ask? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and so we, you know, we got, got the lawyers together and I went in there and did it. And um, that album uh, garnered me my actual first number one record of do you get enough love yeah um, which to this day you know it's still uh a personal favorite of mine because because it was my first uh solo and the first solo album the first single and just so many first attributed uh to to, to that, that album yeah. that i'm proud of and it was interesting because i planned that album along with Kenny uh what we did was we the sequencing this was the first time an album was done where the one whole side was all slow music the okay. other side uh produced by Al McKay from Earth Wind and Fire was all the up tempo things and that was a deliberate plan uh for that particular yeah. album yes yeah well I can tell you do you get enough love is a personal favorite of literally everybody that I know so, yeah. <laughs> everybody that I know do you yeah. get enough love number one tune number yes. one yes no yes. there was a confusing era with the albums because suddenly it was as if the Jones girls had disappeared gone from Philadelphia Philadelphia was finished and then we got the one with can't you Can't Have My Love. What's that album called? Keep It Coming. Keep It Coming. That's the one. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, 
Kenny Burke uh, produced that. Well, we had actually produced it. Kenny had actually produced that album for us before we left Philly International. It was in the can. Oh, Those right. songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, once uh, they released, Kenny and them released that when we were no longer in, under contract with them three months after the On Target album came out. And it actually ended up doing more than... Uh, on target yeah. so that's why people were so confused during that time well, oh well i mean you guys we know you're with rca now but the the jams and the hits are coming from you know uh, the An old album that's uh, on the philly <laughs> label that's no more and you're going right. what <laughs> right exactly see, again this is another point why these stories need to be told so you give clarity to what was going on because i can tell you People have been confused for about 30, 40 years as to what was going on with those albums. One minute you're on RCA, then you're back on Philly. It was that. So there is your explanation, people. See, it was in the can. Yes. So, <laughs> but I mean, you continued doing what you do. You know, and for I did. I took a break from 88 because uh, Do You Get Enough Love was number one in 86. So I toured. All up until I got married the same year um, right. to my to my ex husband, my now ex husband, um, eighty six, and I toured from eighty six till I found out I was pregnant eighty eight, and then from eighty eight until nineteen ninety one ninety two, uh, I took a break from singing, and then uh, then we got on. yes, and then we then we got an offer from ARP Records there in London. And yeah. we came there and recorded uh, the Jones Girls coming back, did a couple yeah. of shows, did a, did a, a European tour. And uh, that was in 92. And then that was really actually, that, that album did pretty good over there. Um, uh, uh, but that was actually the final uh, yeah. album of the Jones Girls because it was a lot, it was very difficult recording that album. Uh, and we were never able to get back uh, to the to me as and we were. as we were, yeah. uh, right. So we couldn't get back to that. And uh, we officially ended the group after that album came out. And I came back and did a solo album over there with you. Uh, yeah. with, that was the name of that album. Yeah, yeah. With the same label mm -hmm, over there. Right. And that was 90 three, I think, 93, 94. Because I remember seeing you guys at the Dominion. At the in, Dominion. Yeah. That's right, Tottenham yes. Court Road. Great yes. memory. I mean, yes. It's we had two shows. My mom came over that night. She came, she was over there and came up on stage for one of those shows, both, both of them, I believe. Yeah. And tore it up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tore it up. I, got, I have pictures from uh, the uh, Everest who opened for us gave me the entire book of all the pictures of, of that night. It was a so, magnificent night. I remember. Yes, it I was. remember it clearly. Great memory. Yeah. So Jones Girls disbanded and then obviously you lost Valerie. Yes. Valerie died first. And, right. And then the shock of, of Brenda. Yeah. You know? I mean, and my mom, my mom, yeah. five years after Val, Val yeah. was 2001, uh, 20 years, man. It'll be 20 years since she wow. passed away, uh, December 2nd of this year. And then my mom passed away in 2006. Yeah. Uh, and all during that time, um, I was performing here and there, you know, but I actually got into the corporate world and just was holding down a, you know, pretty cushy corporate job and uh, not sing, singing every now and then whenever somebody. And then all of a sudden, once my son graduated from high school, um, I decided people start come, where are you? Well, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. And it's right after my mom passed. Well, a little before I start putting the, well, 2005, 2006, I started putting the word out there that I was interested in possibly, you know, getting back out there to perform and, uh, Gene Kern. You still my, have the voice. You still yeah. have the voice. You should be using it. And my girl, my girl, Gene Kern, uh, 
put me on one of the shows that she was on. She talked to the promoter, and it's just been full steam ahead since uh, 2006. Yeah, because uh, you guys have been coming and touring. and it's Oh, great. yeah. It's great yes. to see you guys still and doing looking, it. And they're looking forward to once this pandemic is is over with, you know, people really, uh, real, I mean, I'm getting phone calls every day asking me, are you available for this date in June or July of this year? And it, based on, you know, the pandemic, we'd love to have you. So I have quite a few agreements uh, right now. So we're hoping and praying that uh, this thing, you know, just goes away. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Go I mean, away so we can all get back together. Get like back to we normal were. and get some music. Because as I always say to the artists, you know, you guys have been keeping us going through this pandemic because when we couldn't get out, we couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. You put on the records, you drink a little champagne and you feel like you're there in a club. You do. <laughs> you know, you do. It's, yes. You guys have kept us going. So yes. we're very grateful for all that you've done and you do. Well, thank you, and I, I'm going to I'm going to keep on doing it because, especially now, uh, because the music that we recorded way back then, love music, message music, music to me that just make you feel good, make you feel sexy, make you feel Absolutely. loved, and make you feel empowered, and that's the music that I plan to continue to bring out there through the live performances and I'm, uh, I have a, a single out now called that's a remake of Who Can I Run To? I Won't Tell that's doing quite well and I'm uh, looking forward to that getting a lot more exposure in May when our Unsung episode comes out. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean yeah. another favorite and even though it's a, a slow tune it was a hit I mean, it was absolutely. It, that was a big hit. It, in fact, it was a gave uh, re, had a huge resurgence in 1995 when Escape did it. And a lot of people didn't know that it was actually on the B side of you're going to make me love somebody else. So right. it was a, a huge hit. And it's always been my personal favorite. So oh, really? not only now, oh, you know, the, the, who can I run to? It, that's my favorite Jones Girl song. Wow. Yes. I mean, it is a favorite. It is a favorite. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, it, it has been covered again so many times and sampled, and even your son, Cam, that you were yes. speaking about earlier. That was. Yes. You know, and he and PJ, P, and I love their version. Their hip hop version is, is so cool. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm loving that. Uh, and they, they have redone quite a few that's coming okay. out. They, they, yeah, they have a uh, CD coming out, I think around May, May or June, that has their remakes of uh, all of our songs. Right. Well, Done hip hop style. Special. It's pretty special when people, you know, use your music as inspiration to sample it, cover it, whatever. Sample but it. I think Absolutely. it's something even more so when it's your own son. Yes. <laughs> you know? He's in the family. Yes. It's your own the son. My son and, and Valerie's son, my nephew. My son right. and my nephew. Okay, yes. I, I didn't know that the, the other guy with him is your nephew. Yeah, that's Valerie's son. son. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. Val Valerie's only child, he's my only son. And then Valerie, we both had the boys and Brenda had two girls. Right. Yes. So they really come up like brother and sister. They're not even cousins. They like brother right. and oh. sister. Close. Yeah, Cam, Cam and... PJ are just four, three and a half months apart. And they they were raised more, they're like brothers. They don't even consider themselves cousins. Yeah. They're like brothers, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how close you girls were. You even, you know, planned your pregnancies together. Even your pregnancies coincided. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. So tell me about the Unsung series. This is what we want to hear about. It is uh, we're, our uh, story, and it's a beautiful story. People are going to, that's why I don't talk that much about the middle years of traveling, because all of that is in this story. Okay. And it's, it is coming out. The new season of Unsung on TV One starts March 21st. 
and we are the finale. We're the last episode for the season, and ours will be shown May 9th. May and 9th. I'm yes, a note. <laughs> yes, it's May 9th on TV One. And the sad thing is that it's a beautiful story. It tells everything. And the one of the people that's featured in the story, who is my designer, my makeup artist, he was running the Jones Girls Detroit page, just designed absolutely all of my clothes the past 10 years. He just passed away on Saturday, suddenly. I saw the message and, on your on your Yeah. Social media. Yeah. So this is the past couple of days have been kind of, uh, yeah. sad for me and then I know some, um, the episode now is going to be very bittersweet you know because it's like I'm uh, having to gonna have to relive the stories about both of my sisters passing and then now him as and, well so well, I was gonna say you know it's like you, you're telling the story but three of the people two of the people are missing Two of the yes. girls are missing, you know. Are missing, yeah. They can't but it, they, see it they did a very the it, but it's they they did an excellent job of telling the story through me and through different uh, people that they interviewed that have been a part of the Jones girls, you know, former managers and cousins and you know friends and you know so it's it's really Cam and PJ so it's a it's a great story. Absolutely. So it's told by yourself, obviously, and all the people mm -hmm. that were associated with the Jones girls who know the original journey. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, again, I keep going back to when I speak to other artists, most of them say, you know, when you see or when the public see the success, the little top bit of the iceberg, they don't see the hard work, toil, sweat and tears of years that went beforehand, before you get to that little piece of fame at the top that everybody then recognizes. Exactly. And when you say work, hard work, <laughs> it was some hard work, but it was work of love. You know, it, but it, we practiced, we practiced, we rehearsed, we rehearsed. And then back in the day, you had to, duplicate your voice over and over and over again. There was no such thing as singing one little part and then they can just fly it through like today. So all of those things, having to uh, learn how to sing something the exact same way was only ways of cultivating. That's to me why so many of us old school artists can stand up and easily do an hour show, hour and a half show, um, because vocally we, we can handle it with our vocals because they're conditioned to and trained wherein now yeah. you, the, you go in the studio and you can just sing that you sing the song down once, sing the background parts and you go home. And then, so there's no, your, your voice, your vo vocal cords aren't conditioned to sing. Yeah, to take that pressure so that when exactly. you then, and, and you know, to. it's great that you've explained it that way. And, and I always say, the only way you can get experience is by doing the time. You can't Ex get You got to do the work. You Put can't the work get experience in. by cutting right. corners. You know, you have right. to do the time. But you know, it, you explaining it that way makes it very clear as to why when you listen to you guys singing live is still powerful is still on point to the very yeah. last song you come on and do an encore which is going to be like two or three songs because they never want you to go they always want another one right <laughs> you know right but that voice is still there on point to the end. And as you say, you know, it's because of how you all had to practice and rehearse and sing it over and over and over again, exactly the same. You've got a strength now that possibly some of the newer artists don't have because they, the music industry has changed such that the convenience of, you know, the engineering and the mechanics in the studio, they can just sing a little bit. And then, you know, it's, Put out go over, 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 and over again sounds like a more powerful thing. You don't realize they're not that great until you go and see them live. 
right because the the little differences the little differences of having to try to duplicate your voice back in the day because i mean there was no such thing as cutting and pasting like like they do now the the those those little differences those little inflections where it you know you can't match exactly um is what really truly made the harmonies so beautiful because yeah. now because of the cutting and the pasting and the flying everything sounds mechanical yeah. exactly and yeah. that that's to me that's the difference in music back in the day versus music and of, of voices today. today yes yeah, absolutely well you know i your sisters i know are looking down on you your mother is looking down on you and they're so yeah. proud of shirley keeping the legacy going keeping the tradition going and flying the jones girls flag Yes, and I'm going to continue to do that as long as people want me to fly it. I'm, I'm going well, to. You know, it. they're going to want you to do that until the bitter end. Okay. You All know right. So you, hey, well, then, hey, you know, then we we're want to, to see you back in the UK as soon as is possible. Yes. And you know, as soon as we're all safe to travel and etc. Cetera, yes. et cetera, we want to and see I, you guys. And I think it's going to be soon. I think it's truly now going to be sooner than later, which three or four months ago, I had my doubts. But with the vaccines and, you know, it's, uh, it's seemingly going, you know, going away slowly but surely. And I just yeah. pray that that people in the meantime, stay masked up, social distance, stay home as much as you can, you know, other than yeah. necessary, necessary duties. Um, so that we can all get together and, get and together enjoy and hug and, 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 uh, and, and enjoy again, and love. You know? Yes. But yes. I have to, I always say, this is one of the best things to come out of the pandemic and not being able to travel it because interviews like this up until last year really didn't take place. You kind of, they didn't. it would have been on the phone. So, you know, right this is a great thing that's come out of it that we can get a visual and we can see Shirley with her earrings and her yeah. hair going on and being fabulous. <laughs> and, 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 and her leopard pajamas. Her leopard top, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it, this is a great thing that's come out of the pandemic and, and everything else. So, you know what, every success with Unsung, we look forward Thank to you. seeing your episode. And as I said, we're looking forward to seeing you back in the UK. It's, I, I can't wait. And when I come to the UK, you got to fix any of those meals that you've been, been posting on Facebook because I've it's been watching. Deal. It's All right. Deal. <laughs> you it's better bring, bring one to me because <laughs> you look, I mean, that food looks so gorgeous. I'll be wanting to come through the phone and get some of it. <laughs> it's a deal. Dinner right. on me when you get back to the UK. All right, so, Barry. And yes. to all of your friends and everybody over there in the UK, God bless you all. And let's get, hopefully, to well, I'll be there to so that we can all just love and hug and sing together. We can't wait. We cannot wait. You all are right. one of the icons for sure. You know, so many other vocalists look up to you and even love working with you. <laughs> oh, so, you know, yes. They're like, okay, we've got, <laughs> Shirley at the hideaway. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, you know, well, Shirley, all the very best. And we look forward to hearing whatever you got coming out, whenever you've got it coming out. And also Cam, your all right. son. We want to well, we'll hear keep, his stuff we'll, too. We'll keep you all posted. Please do. All, all right. the best. Thank all right. You Take care. Your time. Lots of you, love. Bye-bye. Peace. Bye.